How many of you in here, if you hurt my feelings, how many of you could apologize and said, say to me, I'm sorry, I made a mistake? How many of you could do that? I could do that with y'all. Shame, I'm sorry, I am a mistake. That's the difference between shame and guilt. I was talking to a friend on the phone last night and she said, oh my God, you're going to South by Southwest? Are you gonna hang out with like rock stars? And I was like, better. <laughs> better. I'm gonna hang out with the real badasses, the teachers, for sure. So I'm happy to be here. Thank y'all for having me. Um, I am going, I just tell you this, I spoke at South by Southwest last year. I'll just tell you this. I'm like coming over here so it's like a secret. Um, so on the way here, I got pulled over and I had no driver's license. I had no proof of insurance and I was speeding. And the guy goes, geez, I mean, where are you going? I said, I'm going to give a talk at South by Southwest. And he said, about what? I said, failure. Um, <laughs> so this morning I rode here with my sister from Houston, and we're going back because we live down the road. And I was like, oh my God. And she said, what? And I said, I'm gonna talk about shame today. There's a chance we're gonna end up naked hitchhiking because <laughs> this conference may manifest our trip here. I am gonna talk about daring classrooms and what I believe courage looks like and is. So we're gonna start here. So I am sitting on about 200,000 pieces of data that I've collected over the last 15 years. And one of the questions I've had from the beginning of my career was simply this. Is courage the willing to show up and be seen, even when we can't control the outcome? Is courage something that's inherent in us, or is it something that we can teach and develop in people and ourselves? And so as both a social worker and a teacher, this is my 21st year in the classroom. Um, yeah. I'm very quick to call bullshit when someone says you can't teach something. Um, I always, my first question when they say, oh, you can't really teach empathy, you have it or you don't. You can't teach courage, either have it or you don't. I'm like, let me talk to a group of teachers about that. Um, because to me, it's questionable. So what I've learned in the last couple of years is you can absolutely teach courage. You can develop it in yourself and you can develop it in others. And it basically boils down to four skill sets. Um, vulnerability, clarity of values, trust, and what I call rising skills. The, the ability to get back up when we fall, when we experience setbacks and failures. Um, it's interesting because I didn't think rising skills or resilience was going to be on this list, but as it turns out, the most courageous men and women I've interviewed over the past 15 years talk about their courage only being possible because they know how to get back up when they inevitably fall. And one of the things that's true is that if you're brave enough often enough, you will fall. It's not a question if you might fall, you will, by definition, if you're brave, in your classrooms, in your life, with your partners, with your kids, with the people you care about, if you're brave, you're gonna get hurt. I mean, the brokenhearted are the bravest among us because they had the courage to love, right? And so we have to learn how to get back up. So here's what I wanna to talk to you about today. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about vulnerability I told him, I was like, I'm ready to do my talk, I need seven hours. Um, I just need to be with my people for a long stretch. Um, what I'm actually gonna talk to you about today is the number one thing that gets in the way of developing courage and building courageous classrooms. Um, we're gonna start with vulnerability and then I'm gonna talk to you about shame. And I'm gonna tell you why I've decided to talk about shame today. Because I feel really comfortable with you and I think you're a fearless group of people and I don't think we can, I don't think we can pretend that this is not getting in the way. I don't think we can say this is not happening in homes, this is not happening in the environment we live in right now. This is part of the landscape and it's become worse over the last six months and so I want to talk about it. But let's start with vulnerability and let's start with the willingness to be vulnerable, the willingness to really show up and let people in. How many of you were raised to believe that vulnerability is weakness? 
most of us. Here's what I can tell you, and I'll challenge you. Yell up if you can think of something. I cannot find in 200,000 pieces of data a single example of courage that was not completely defined by vulnerability. Let me challenge you. Can you think of one courageous thing that you have seen someone do in your life that did not require vulnerability, that did not require uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure? One thing. I cannot, I find zero evidence. And let me tell you, I've stood in front of a group like this of special force military people. They can't think of a single example of courage that did not require absolute vulnerability. But we hate vulnerability because it opens us up to being hurt. And we think, I don't want to be vulnerable because vulnerability, there's my slideshow, there it is, is the center of shame and scarcity and fear and anxiety and grief and disappointment. So I am going to armor up and self-protect. I'm not going to let people hurt me, see me, take advantage of me. The problem is that when we armor up like that, not only is vulnerability certainly the center of these experiences, it's also the center of these. Love and belonging and joy. No vulnerability, no love, no belonging, no joy. What do you think is the most vulnerable human affect we experience? What's the, most, what's the hardest emotion for us to handle as humans? Joy. How many of you are parents? How many of you have ever stood over your child while they're sleeping and thought, oh my God, I love you like so much I can't breathe. And then in that split second pictured something horrific happening to your child. How many of you have done that? It should be 95% of you. And just, you know, I mean, this is a perfect example of that. Many years ago, when I first was studying this concept of foreboding joy, this fear we have about being joyful, I was on date night with my husband, and we come home, and we, I see the lights still on the kids' bedroom. I'm like, circle the block till they're tucked in. Circle the block. Um, <laughs> so we go, we get some like TCBY yogurt or something. We come back, everyone's tucked in. I'm like, okay, this is awesome. Let's go. And I remember we parked our car on the curb by our house, and we we're walking in, and the song on the radio when we got out of the car was like one of my favorite songs, Little River Band. Do you remember the song? Like, Friday night, it was late, I was walking you home, we got down to the gate and I was dreaming of the night. And I remember like, oh my God, this is like amazing. And we were holding hands. I go, oh my God. And she's like, what's wrong? And he's like, I was like, do you ever think like, someone's gonna jump out from behind the bushes and shoot us down? <laughs> and he's like, uh, no. <laughs> Did you see somebody? And I said, no, I'm just saying, you know, like when things are going really well, you're waiting for like that to happen. Yes or no? Yes. And he's like, no. And I was like, yeah, because I mean, here's the thing. I would hope the babysitter would come out and like move us so the kids didn't find us. And he's like, oh my God, Brene. No, and I'm serious. And I don't even think on the list it was like, I should put like a whole, like, you know, if you need to call us, if we get killed in the front yard, like something, <laughs> something so they know to call my mom and keep the kids in the house. And he's like, he goes, I'm guessing date night's over. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hell yeah, date night's over. I'm like, we got we to gotta come up with a list, a plan. Um, but am I alone in this? Right. Because joy is so, and I'll just share this with you. What was the one variable men and women who had the capacity to lean heavily into joy? What was the one variable they shared in common? This, is, this, should, this, this should be a pedagogy of itself. What is the one variable that people who can really lean into joy share in common? It is part of vulnerability, but it's actually a practice. Gratitude. The only variable that really separates men and women who cannot lean into joy, who start dress rehearsing tragedy, and the reason we dress rehearse tragedy is so we can beat vulnerability to the punch. So what we do is like, oh, this great thing's happening. I'm gonna start picturing worst case scenario so that when I get hurt and it happens, I'm all prepared for it, right? But how many of you think we can actually prepare for that? You cannot. 50% of the people in this room have probably experienced the thing that we dress rehearse and they could come up here one at a time and tell you, you can practice that all you want. 
that will do nothing to help you when that moment comes. The only thing you're doing is squandering the joy that you need that builds a reservoir for when hard things happen. So as it turns out, our bodies really neurobiologically experience joy as vulnerability and threat, and they sh they, we quiver. And so some of us use the quiver as a warning sign to start thinking about terrible things, and others use that quiver as a reminder to be grateful, to stop on the sidewalk in that moment and say, I'm really grateful for this date night. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for our time together. But that's harder, right, than to go, have you ever pictured someone? <laughs> um, so love, belonging, and joy, absolute vulnerability. But also these things, courage, empathy, trust, innovation and creativity. No vulnerability, no innovation, no creativity. My favorite call that I get, hey Brene, would you like to come to our, speak to our brand new startup in Silicon Valley, it's amazing, and we loved your TED talk, and we're bringing in thought leaders, and we wanna shape our culture, and okay, great, that sounds fun, what do you want me to talk about? Uh, anything but vulnerability and shame. <laughs> I got nothing. Um, no vulnerability, no creativity, no innovation. Accountability, adaptability to change, hard conversations. I mean, this is an easy question. How many of you think where you work, your school, your district, your grade level, how many of you think where you work would be better if people had a stronger skill set about having real, honest, respectful, hard conversations? Yes or no? Yeah, everybody. We dodge those and they become toxic in our culture. Feedback, problem solving, and ethical decision making all require vulnerability. They all require, one of my favorite stories, I'm in Canary Wharf in London talking to 150 hedge fund managers about vulnerability. They're required to attend. <laughs> it was like Brooke Brothers threw up in their room. Um, and I'm uncomfortable because I'm like, wow, these people look hostile. Um, all men, all white, and all not happy to be there. And so I only get like five minutes in before someone's like, excuse me, we don't know why you're here. <laughs> we're bankers, we're high compliance driven, we don't do vulnerability. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know why I'm here either. I haven't even ridden the London Eye. There's so many things I wanna do. Um, I, I'm not sure either. I said, you know, what is the, you know, why am I here actually? Like, what are you up against right now? And they're like, we're a high compliance banking industry. Our biggest problem right now is ethical decision making. Hmm, how many of you in this room right now have ever tried to make an ethical right decision in the face of a group moving the other direction? You will piss off some people, yes or no? There's probably nothing more vulnerable than standing up in front of a group of people that you respect, that you work with, that you like, that you feel a sense of belonging with and saying, this is not the right thing to do. So vulnerability is the birthplace of everything we want more of in our lives. The problem is that we end up here. Instead of having an open heart, we end up with a closed heart. We end up with a protected heart for a lot of different reasons. Some of them are environmental. Let me tell you this for sure. The greatest casualty of trauma is vulnerability. The, the worst thing we lose in trauma is vulnerability. And let's be very clear about what constitutes trauma. Racism is trauma. Poverty is trauma. Classism, trauma. Homophobia, heterosexism, trauma. And so the, the, the biggest casualty of that is I can't be vulnerable. Well, when vulnerability the, the ability to really be who we are becomes a realm of only the privileged. We have lost our capacity to create a school, a home, and a country that we love. Period. Period. 
So there are those of us who will fight the big fight on the outside, but in no way can we give up the fight on the inside. You can make your classroom, and some, to some degree, if you have a collective group of brave, badass people, a whole school, but certainly in a classroom, you can, and I have seen it done many times, you can create a culture of courage within a classroom that can be the only space a child has, or an adult, even in a college classroom. I only teach graduate level, MSW, PhD, that's it. You can create a space in that classroom if you're willing to be excruciatingly uncomfortable and vulnerable. That may be the only space that student has to take the armor off his or her heart. But the one thing that will kill it faster than anything else, the one betrayal of vulnerability, is shame. That cannot happen in that classroom. And here's what you need to know before we start talking about shame. 85% of the men and women I have interviewed over the last 15 years can remember a shaming incident at school that was so devastating it forever changed how they thought of themselves as learners. So let's do this. Raise your hand if you're in here and you can think about something that happened to you in school that changed how you thought of yourself. Right, because here's the other statistic. Over 90% of the people, the men and women we've interviewed, can remember a specific teacher, coach, or administrator who made them believe in their self-worth when no one else did. How many of you remember that teacher or that coach or that administrator? So what does that mean? So, you know, so the question teachers always say, well, does that mean like they were doing more good or harm or what's happening? It doesn't, I mean, what it means, and let me tell you, you can be the same person. What it means is do not ever question the power you have with the people you teach. Learning is inherently vulnerable, and it's like you've got a classroom full of turtles without shells. And the minute they put the shell back on, they're protected from their peers or from the teacher or from whomever, but no learning can come in because no vulnerability, no learning. So we have to really find a way to develop shame-resilient classrooms, not shame-free. Look, here's what we know, 50 years of data. The only people who don't experience shame are people who have no capacity for empathy or connection. We all know shame. Everyone clear on shame? That warm thing that washes over you? <laughs> that makes you feel small and not? So we all have it. And as long as we have a capacity for connection, shame will always be a real thing in our lives because shame is the intensely painful belief that there's something about us that makes us unworthy of love and belonging. For children, especially in lower school, probably through about fifth grade, shame is literally the threat of being unlovable. Shame is l actually neurobiologically in lower school experienced as trauma because when you are not lovable and you're dependent on safety and nurturing and food and shelter, and you're not lovable, then that's a threat to your survival, right? So how, so if teachers, and let me tell you, in the ranking, let me tell you exactly how it goes. Parents, teachers, clergy, peers. Because one of the things that exacerbates shaming is a power differential. So that's why we have, we, we, we can inflict, inflict the most damage and we can heal the, the most wounds. So I want to make sure we all know what we're talking about. So we're going to go through these. Let me put them all up. We're going to go through these four because they're radically different concepts. We use these words interchangeably, and they are completely different. And one of the four elements of shame resilience that the most resilient men and women have in common is they know the difference between these words, and they use the right word to express the right emotion. So shame. Shame is a focus on self. Shame is I am bad. There's something inherently wrong with me. The one we confuse it with the most is guilt. Guilt is I did something bad. Shame is a focus on self. Guilt is a focus on behavior. I hand out papers and John gets his paper back and says, 
oh my God, I'm so stupid, I'm such an idiot, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid for not studying. Shame or guilt? Shame, the focus is on him. So what about if John gets the paper back and he reads it and he says, God, not studying was such a stupid thing to do. Guilt, one's a focus on self, one's a focus on behavior. You look at a kid and you say, you are a great kid. That was a stupid choice. Guilt or shame? Guilt. So let me ask you, let me give you a visceral understanding of why this is different. How many of you in here, if you hurt my feelings, how many of you could apologize and said, say to me, I'm sorry, I made a mistake? How many of you could do that? I could do that with y'all. Shame, I'm sorry, I am a mistake. That's the difference between shame and guilt. Is it semantics? No, it's not semantics. Let me tell you why. Shame is highly correlated with addiction, depression, bullying, violence, eating disorders, and suicide. And here's the big piece you need to understand. Guilt is inversely correlated with those outcomes, meaning the higher the level of guilt shame talk, the less likely it is for a child to experience those outcomes. As it turns out, many researchers argue that guilt is actually a protective factor against things like addiction. That's shocking, right? And it's not just semantics, you can't, how many of you have ever experienced shame just, a, just the way someone looks at you? So you can't feel shame towards someone but use the right vocabulary and pull that off. But it's a focus on behavior. First longitudinal study they did with kids, they took a, a cohort of kids in fifth grade, measured whether they were shame prone or guilt prone, meaning did they use shame self-talk or guilt self-talk? Followed them up as seniors in high school. Shame prone kids more likely to drop out, attempt suicide, and engage in high risk drug and alcohol behaviors. Guilt prone kids more likely to finish high school, apply for college, complete uh, community service projects and hours, and engage in lower risk sex and, and alcohol behaviors and drugs. It is a huge difference between shame and guilt. Does it make sense to y'all so far? Okay, then you have humiliation. So this happened in a classroom that I was visiting. A teacher hands back papers. Everyone has a paper, right? Who didn't get a paper back? Who didn't get a paper back? Sally didn't get a paper back. How many of you are surprised that Sally did not get her paper back? Wait, keeps going. Sally, how many times have I asked you to put your name on your paper? Let me write it for you, S-T-U-P-I-D. I'm observing in the classroom as a shame researcher. <laughs> but wait, so let me tell you Sally's experience here. Sally's experience is this. If Sally's self-talk is, that is the meanest, nastiest, most rotten teacher ever, awesome. <laughs> or if her self, okay, because that is humiliation. Let me tell you the difference between shame and humiliation. Shame is I deserved what just happened. Humiliation is I did not deserve what happened. The only thing that, that really separates shame and humiliation is the variable of deserving. So if Sally is saying, oh my God, you are the most hideous thing ever and I did not deserve that, awesome. If Sally's self-talk is, I'm so stupid, I'm so stupid, why did I do that? Here's the danger and here's why humiliation is better than shame. Because as a primary caregiver, as another teacher, as someone Sally, trust, she will not tell me if she experiences that shame, as shame because there's no news. But what is she gonna convey? I got called stupid, I'm stupid. But if she experiences it as humiliation, she's a little pissed off. I'll never forget, oh my God, my daughter was a kindergartner and her teacher called me and she said, I always was kind of confused about what you did, now I'm clear. And I was like, oh God, um, why? And she said, because Ellen was in the glitter center this morning and I said, woo, Ellen, you're messy. And she sat straight up and she said, I may be making a mess, but I am not messy. Um, which I was like, oh my God. I've been marked by the whole, you know, you know would that spread like wildfire across teachers or yes or no? 
Yeah, they're like, Brene Brown, she's crazy. Make sure you add a lot of stuff in there when you're like, yeah. Um, but that's what we've told our, our kids. Like, look, if you burn down the school, there are going to be some consequences. But no matter what happens, no name calling at all. Not at school, not in this house, not with each other. Steve and I try not, you know, we, we don't model that. And between siblings, let me tell you the biggest heartbreak I've ever seen probably in my research life is interviewing siblings, adult siblings, who have a very disrupted relationship, who were cruel to each other, because you know how siblings work, right? I can shame you because I know all the stuff that hurts you. I know about the acne and the struggle with the weight, and I know everything. Parents who do not intervene around that and say, that will not happen in this house. You will not talk to each other that way. If Charlie, my son's doing his homework, and he's like, God, I'm so dumb. No, no name calling. I didn't call, I didn't call Ellen a name. You called yourself a name, no name calling. How else does shame show up in classrooms and in schools and in organizations? I mean, I do most of my work in like Fortune 100 companies. How does it show up there? Same way in classrooms. Favoritism, gossip, name calling. And these are adults, but that's how it shows up. The last of the, what we call the four conscious affects is embarrassment, fleeting, often funny after it happens, but the hallmark of embarrassment is when we do something embarrassing, we know that we're not the only ones who have done it. Does that make sense? When you're in shame, let me tell you how shame works. Shame cannot survive being spoken. If something shaming happens to me and I can call my sister or I can tell my husband, oh my God, and this is exactly what it sounded like, I'm in a shame shit storm right now, let me tell you what just happened. Um, it can't hold on. Shame cannot survive being spoken because shame requires you to believe you're alone in order for it to maintain its power. Does that make sense? It's about speaking truth to shame. It's about saying, this is what happened. I feel completely alone and like this makes me a bad person. There are three ways we defend ourselves or from shame. And I want you to think about yourself, but I also want you to think about your students because this is something I draw on the board the first day of school. I draw these shields and I say, here are the shame shields. You feel shame. You feel not enough. You feel unworthy. You're going to pick up one of these. You're going to move away, move against, move toward. What is moving away? Some of us, when we feel shame, we secret creep, secret keep, we hide. We get quiet. We just want to disappear. How many of you move away when you're in shame? Like, I just want to disappear. Some of us move toward. Some of us people please our way out of that emotional corner. Oh, you're so awesome. I'm really sorry. I know I suck. I'm really, you know, we people please our way out. How many of you do that? I do all of them, sadly. Um, and then there's moving against, which is my favorite shield um, and the most destructive, and that is using shame and anger to combat shame and anger. You want to dance? We'll dance. You want to do this? We'll do this. We'll totally do this. And I will emotionally annihilate you. And in the process, my self-worth and my authenticity will be just devastated. Because I will walk away thinking, oh my god, who was, in who was unleashed in there? But let me ask you this. You hand, out a, pro you hand a project back. How many of you thinking about this concept, can literally see kids picking up these shields. How many of them pull their hoodie on, slump down? My daughter had, wore a hoodie all through middle school. We live in Houston, it's like 100 degrees. And finally, at some point, I was like, Elle, what's up? She's like, no, man, this is my invisibility cloak from Harry Potter. I was like, what do you mean? And she goes, yeah, if I put my hands in here, you can't even see me. It's like, oh, I get it. I would have totally worn those in middle school move toward the people pleasers, and then the people who rail against. Screw this class, which is an asshole. I hate this whole thing. Yes or no? Helping, this is not mystical information. Share this with your students. Take a picture of this thing with your phone and put it up on your class and just say, hey, when we feel bad about ourselves and we go into shame, these are the shields we grab. The problem is when you're holding this, you can't learn and I can't see you. So let's talk about putting these down. This is the conversation. What is the antidote to shame? Is empathy. Shame, if you put shame in a Petri dish, 
and you douse it with three things, it will grow exponentially into every corner and crevice of your school and classroom. Shame only needs three things to grow like wild, I mean, secrecy, silence, and judgment. You put that on top of shame, it's out of control. But if you put the same amount of shame in a Petri dish and you douse it with empathy, you have created an environment hostile to shame. Shame cannot survive being, it can't survive empathy because empathy is what? Empathy is me too. And if you don't think you're alone, you can't stay in shame. This is my favorite work on empathy. It's Teresa Wiseman's work. It's perspective taking. It's staying out of judgment, recognizing emotion and communicating it and staying mindful. And I'm gonna end with this perspective taking. The wider, straighter, more Judeo-Christian, middle class you are, the less good you are at this. I mean, that's me too, sorry for all of us, but <laughs> you know why? Because we, we weren't raised with critical awareness. We weren't raised with parents pointing out, hey, where are the white, where, where are the white folks on that show? Because all the folks were white on Hee Haw. Like, I, my parents did not point that out. And so when we talk about perspective taking, that is about taking the perspective of others and that's where we have to become listeners and ask, what did this mean for you? What was this like for you? And our answer, you know, you know the number one exacerbator of shame in conversation? Empathic failure. When a child says to you or your partner says to you, I'm in shame about this, and you go back and say, no, it's good, it's not a big deal, I promise. That's empathic failure. Tell me why this was so painful. Tell me why this was so painful. Well, it was painful because in my family, when you say this, people believe this. This is where we have to become the learners. Let me look at my time. It says zero. <laughs> I, what if I just assume that and then I'm just starting? Um, <laughs> um, I just love, you know why? I'm gonna tell you, and I'll say this, I know this is gonna be recorded and people are gonna get, I'll get emails about it, but it's worth it. People ask me all the time, like, what's your goal in your life? I was like, to make the world a braver place. If you had one opportunity, what would be the most effective impact you could ever do? I said, if I could get in front of every teacher in the world and we could have real conversations about shame, about vulnerability, about courage, because I think the revolution will not be televised, it will be in your classrooms. That is where this will happen. A hundred percent. You are working on the hardest edges of love. And my invitation to you is there's a lot of hate out there right now, yes or no? Yes. My invitation to myself as well, because I'm not good at this right now, is every time you hear something hate full, or someone's talking about hate, try to switch out the word for pain. Try to think about pain. Um, it's going to, this is only going to change with you. I wouldn't pull parents in to do this. I would pull teachers because this is where we can do it. Um, and I'll just stop now and say um, thank you for inviting me and thank you from the bottom of my heart for waking up every day and making the choice to be brave with your lives. It makes a, hu a bigger difference than you will ever know. So thank y'all. Thank you.